During the winter of 2013, the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team hosted the Ohio Beef Cattle School and broadcast each of the three sessions via webinar. The concluding session focused on enterprises that would aid in keeping Ohio's cattlemen competitive in the marketplace. A portion of the program that evening included a presentation by OSU Extension Ag Educator Jeff McCutcheon on direct marketing of beef and the experiences of Eric Scott and his family's marketing effort that gets their beef directly into the hands of consumers. This is that presentation. Now I want to talk about direct marketing. We've got um, Eric Scott talking. My name is Eric Scott. Uh, we run Scott Family Farms here in Georgetown, Ohio. Uh, we have a 70 cow cow calf operation as well as a background to finish. Uh, we're pretty well start to finish with some of our livestock here. Um, we also raise hay, uh, pasture of course. Uh, we raise 20 acres of barley tobacco and around 300 acres of corn and beans. Uh, we, we've been selling direct to consumer retail cuts uh, as well as quarters, heads, and holes now for uh, about five years. So what we're selling here is uh, a locally grown product that people really seem to be turned on to. Um, the, the local aspect seems to be the more valuable of, of your organic, all natural. Um, value added commodities to me. Our best chance was with the local grain. Um, we sell retail cuts as well as the quarters, halves, and holes. Um, we're primarily in an all black Angus setting. We're trying to sell what we believe is the best steak you can get. Um, that's what we're shooting for. That's our target is to get you, to get our customers um, that that prime steak with, with just the right amount of marbling and just the right amount of fat around the outside. Uh, so still get the taste and still keep that steak under uh, within federal guidelines as far as portion sizing and, and uh, uh, what your dietary suggestions are. We try to try to keep it within everybody's guidelines. When we start in with our feeder calves here, we usually try to wean at about 200 to 240 days of age. Um, that puts our calves right there in pretty comfortable wean weight. It's not too much work now. Uh, we put them in a background lot where we background them on a lot of um, a pretty heavily balanced diet of hay silage. Um, as well as a, a, a grain portion, but we're trying to rely mostly on that hay salad or egg soup, as a lot of people call it, in the bear bags. Um, we background them up to about 750 to 825 pounds. Um, at 825 pounds, we roll them over to um, a full feed or a finished lot. We change the feed ration, we cut the protein down, we up the fat level, and we up the uh, percent per head per day of a ground feed with a corn based ration. Um, and we go to the full feed or the finished lot, um, we're up to around 35 45 pounds a head a day. Um, and we usually try to cut that finished lot off at about 140 days. Um, we want them to be in there in the last 140 days. Anything over 140 days for us, they start to cost you a little bit more money. And they're starting to lose that better way to go. And they're starting to get pretty big. Um, our carcass size, we're keeping our carcass size a little smaller. Uh, we're not following the industry quite like the rest of uh, the cattle businesses. We like that smaller carcass size. It's easier to sell. As far as packing, we have two packing houses. We work with Mary Packing in Sardinia. We work with uh, R&C Packing in uh, Galpa Lips. Um, both places have their pros and cons. R&C has the uh, good cryogenic plastic wrap, which is uh, pretty important to some of our customers. Um, the main packing in Sardinia is significantly closer and significantly cheaper uh, by the packing rate, and, and we have some customers that insist on having their packing as well. 
At Mary's Packing, um, one of the biggest differences they have is they use a paper wrap, it's a double wrap paper wrap instead of the clear cryogenic pack. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what makes them cheaper by the packing. What we're selling here is quarter half holes and uh, what most people refer to as a retail cut. Uh, you can come to us and buy a single pack of their buys. <clears throat> or you can buy a, a 500 hamburger patties that makes no never mind for us. Um, we do not have an advertising budget. Our advertising budget is word of mouth. That's the only way we sell uh, or we gain customers. Um, and we have customers from the Indiana, Ohio line to Columbus to Maysville, Kentucky. Um, so our reach is, is getting broader every day. Um, this thing started out significantly smaller than that in my head, and it has ballooned into something pretty large. The marketing aspect is going to change. Hopefully, we're looking into a website and Facebook page. Um, where again, we're, we're putting that material together in my spare time, I guess. It's, it's all, uh, we're trying to distinguish what is what is acceptable for the website. Okay, direct marketing. Uh, Eric talked about a lot of things and how his operation has evolved. Um, there are lots of reasons to direct market. Uh, consumers get a benefit. A uh, big thing locally is they know the source. Uh, one thing we found is that they, people may come to you and they're kind of concerned about antibiotics, but if you talk to them how you use antibiotics to treat an animal and, and, and how you do things in, in an appropriate manner and they're comfortable with the way you're raising the product, that may overcome their initial concern. Uh, they may come for desired quality. For, from your angle, from the farmer side, uh, extra income. Uh, you know, there may be a type of production like grass finishing that's not rewarded in current markets. You're not going to take a grass finished steer to the auction market and get a premium price. All right? If you do, you're going to be sorely mad at everybody involved in the process. So direct marketing is important for that. Um, it gives you more control. You, know, you, you get control of the animal to, to almost to the table. And uh, you can capture more of the fortune of the food dollar. Um, there are uh, lots of items to consider. You know, quality of the product you're making, consistency of the quality of the product you're making. There's marketing issues, risk in, in keeping them longer, risk in, in working uh, with consumers. There are some operations that I don't know of a person within the operation who is capable of dealing with customers on a daily basis. No offense to you guys, but, you know, I've made the recommendation at farmers' tables that you don't work with customers, your wife needs to do that, all right? Uh, because that's not a skill everybody has. I'm not trying to be offensive, but that's just the reality. There is extra time and labor requirements. Time and taking it to market, time and moving from market to your freezer, time and getting it out and going to farmer's markets. And there's this whole level of regulation because meat can be a hazardous product and it's not handled correctly. Um, one thing you need to understand is regulations. There are two entities you will probably deal with. Ohio Department of Agriculture and your local health department. What kind of relationship do you have with both? Right? It's not either, it's both. Um, for where you get the animal slaughtered, there are two types of operations. And an operation can have both licenses. All right? There's a fully inspected, where there's a somebody that's inspecting the animal, making sure it is healthy, live and post-mortem. Right? Um, that actually ends up with a label on it, a sticker, and I'll show it here in a second. There's also custom operators. Now, these are inspected facilities. They are clean, they are sanitizable, they're following protocol to produce safe food, but the animal isn't inspected. That is marked not for sale. You can take an animal in, have it slaughtered as a custom, and it goes in your freezer, and as long as you're the only, you and your family are the only ones eating it, you haven't, you're, it's all legal, but you can't sell that, right? Some operations, it may be either, certain kill days are inspected or not. So it kind of depends on the operation of your, your packing plant. 
Uh, this happens to be the, the Ohio inspected label. USDA has a USDA inspected label. Same thing for federal plants. Uh, if you're selling a fully inspected meat, if they pick it up from the facility, your customers pick it up there, you put in an order, you know, various ways to do it, then you don't need a retail license. If you pick up the meat and handle it and move it to another site and act as a seller or deliverer, take it to the farmer's market, to your own market, then you need a license for that. All right? Um, and in order to sell fully inspected meat, you need either a mobile food license or a temporary license. Both of these come from your health, local health department. And since I am talking to more than just the people here in Monroe County, each health department has slightly different regulations. Right? Some health departments do not require mechanical refrigeration to sell at farmer's markets. As long as it's in a cooler and kept to a certain temperature with ice or dry ice or whatever, that's perfectly legal. Other health departments say no, it has to be a mechanical freezer that you're plugged into an external power source. You know, it still has to be kept to a certain temperature. That's a departmental issue. But if you have a license from one health department in the state of Ohio, it works in any county in the state of Ohio. So that's a, that's a positive thing. Um, here's some regulatory, if you ODA uh, inspection, there's a way to get a hold of them. Your health department, you, you're going to have to look under your, your own uh, yellow pages in your county. <coughs> processor. You are now going up the food chain. A processor is key in your ability to do this. Eric mentioned he worked with two because they do things a little different ways. All right, you may find that. You may find one that's more willing to do certain types of cuts. Um, you know, you may find another one that packages it in a certain way. Um, so that's a big consideration. That is a relationship you want to build and make strong. Because they will get you more customers. They will, they, and if your customers are there picking up, they're the face they see with your product. Right? That's an important relationship. Two slides in here, and I'll go through them real quick, but every year I get a call from somebody who bought a freezer beef and tells me that they got gypped, and it was either the farmer or the processor that, that stole their meat, right? Because they're on their bathroom scales, and they bought a 1,200-pound animal, and they only have 300 pounds of meat. Now, they got it trimmed really lean, okay? And they got it boneless, and it's all ground. And, you know, that works out, actually, because not everything of the live animal is edible meat. So there's two calculations, dressing percent and carcass cutting yield, um, as factors into how much actual edible product you're going to get. Um, here's some examples, and all three of these start with a 1,200-pound animal. And depending on both the dressing percent and the cutting yield, how the customer wanted it, you can end up with different final products as far as weight. Um, uh, it's really interesting when I say, yes, ma'am, that's about right. And then they think I'm in cahoots with all of you guys. Uh, and then I have to work them through the math. Um, this is the current drop credit in the, in the nation. Uh, anybody wants to complain about big packers, I use this as my example of why they're important to the industry. Okay? because they can gather a lot of these byproducts, side products that most of us won't find a customer for. And they can put value to them and add value back to the carcass. Currently it's $22.73 per, per 1,300 pound animal. The other times it's a lot bigger. Our small packing plants can't do this. This is a disadvantage we have, right? We need them. I like working with the small packers. I know a lot of great ones, but they all this goes in the rendering bucket, and it's a it's a waste product. Um, if you can sell more of the live animal, you're going to be better off direct marketing. If you can figure out how to make hot dogs 
using some of this extra stuff and have it as a sellable product. I had one producer who, at a farmer's market, found a lady who liked oxtails. You know, it's a tail. And any animal he had going into the packing plant, he had a standing order. If the customer didn't want it, they were to cut it off and put it aside for him. And she bought them all. So he's making, you know, eight or nine bucks a head extra um, by working with that, that customer. Um, not every customer's going to like oxtail. But, you know, you got to have to work to sell more. Uh, there's one drug marketer in Canada at one time said they sell everything but the moo. You know, I don't believe that, but they were trying to, right? So this is this is the reality of, of packing. Uh, and if you can market more than a live animal, you're going to be better off. Uh, cost. You know, we all can figure out the cost of the live animal, you know, and the opportunity cost what markets greater, but uh, we also have some costs associated with processing. You know, there's kill fee, processing charge per pound, wrapping charge. What about marketing? What's the cost to get that steer to the, the packing plant? What's the cost to pick that up and deliver? What's the cost to have freezers all across your, your porch because you can't get rid of it all at one time? You're not selling them in quarters, you're selling them in pieces, right? And how many freezers do you need across your porch? It's kind of funny, but I've seen a lot of direct marketers, that's how they start, and then they get bigger. And what about profit? Profit's not a four-letter word. It's not a bad thing. Well, we can pencil it in. There's three kind of risks when I think about direct marketing, production, management, and financial. I'm going to hit production, uh, you know, reliable processor. Uh, a processor is willing to do cuts that you are. How many of you have heard of the, the flat iron steak? Be eating it, all right? That comes out of the check. Now, not every processor is able, because it takes extra effort to pull out that muscle. Right? It's not just a check roast or grind it for for hamburger or ground beef. Uh, so it takes a little. Not every processor is willing to do that, but it's a high value cut if you can pull it out. It makes the check more valuable. It's one benefit we got from the from the check off. And that's a direct relation. That's a direct example of the value of our checkoff coming back and adding value to, to our products. But are they willing to learn new skills? Are they willing to try it? What about your product and uniformity and consistency? Can you produce prime every day? It's hard to do in the commercial setting. Can you do it on an individual basis? Um, and there's some seasonality. If you come to a processor in the state of Ohio and want to try something new, and you want to do it in the month of November and December, I, would, I if you can get it done, good luck, because most of them are doing deer and other things, and their plants are shut down. They don't have extra time. Now, if you want to do it at other times of the year, when they may be more agreeable to it, you can do that. But there's some seasonality to, to, to meat processing in the state, and you need to be aware of that. Um, what about your risk? You know, what do the consumers want? Um, does your product make what, make fit what the consumers want? But, you know, this takes more time. This isn't just producing the calf and taking it to market. This this is the extra work. This is spending time on the phone talking to people that are mad at you. That's a, that's a question. Um, and what about traceability and liability? This happens to be a, a farmer, and this is actually in France. We took a tour in France. Um, he's not a butcher. But this is a farmer, and he's at a butcher shop. And that product, that roast he's working on, is from his cow. And you notice Henry's in the back, Henry Zerby's in the background. We, we took a, uh, a study tour and look at some of their cutting methods and see if we could, we could make them fit and, and for some of our small uh, scale producers. But the interesting thing was that his name was Earl. And I'll probably mispronounce his last name, but these were the labels that were on his product when we were done. These were the these were the product labels. His name is clearly listed on the product. You want to talk about being able to verify where something comes from or trace it back, right? He was confident enough in his product to 
put his name on the label. Direct marketing, you can do that. There's some risk there, but you can do that. So those are all things to consider.